So we're continuing in this series. We're journeying with Jesus in his final days. A few weeks ago, we were with Jesus on Monday, Thursday, as he prayed to God in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there we asked the how question. How am I going to get through this? Then last week, we were with Jesus on Good Friday as he was hanging on the cross and he cried out to God, why have you forsaken me? And there we asked the why question. Why does God seem silent? Why aren't my prayers answered or working? And so far, this series has felt pretty heavy. It's definitely felt heavy for me preparing these talks. And to be honest, I would be much prefer to preach on other things than this, maybe easier topics, but they are vitally important. And if you're feeling like you're longing for this series to come to an end, I want you to hold on to the tension of that, to stay with it, to hold on to it until next Sunday, until Easter Sunday, to hold out for hope, to hold out for the hope of Easter. Because I think for many of us, this is a picture of where we are at in our faith. And so as we go through this morning, I want you to listen and to hear that sense of holding on and holding out for hope. So today we are in the midst of the silence of Holy Saturday as Joe so helpfully prayed and led us into. We're no longer with Jesus because Jesus is seemingly not here. And here we're going to ask the where question. Where is God when heaven is silent? Where is God when we find ourselves trapped between the pain of Good Friday and the miracle of Easter Sunday? In God on Mute, Pete Gregg says that God's silence is not his absence, but rather his presence in another form. And I think the reality is that this is where a lot of us spend our lives, the in-between of Good Friday and Easter Sunday, somewhere between the cross and the resurrection, In one sense, we know, we can't deny what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And we have hope for the resurrection to come, but maybe that hope is fading, and maybe we feel stuck in the middle, in a kind of limbo, waiting for breakthrough, struggling with unanswered prayer. And it's a a tough place to be because we all long for answers. We want things to be explained. Ultimately, we want resolution. But we often have a tendency to rush to the resurrection and therefore to skip and to miss Holy Saturday, to tidy up the mess too fast. We're going to watch another clip from the course as Pete unpacks this a bit more for us. Some people watching this may well be struggling with faith itself because of some tragedy in their life. And others may be enduring a season of divine silence, feeling like their prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. Yeah, I I can relate to that, actually. Because I've actually never found faith particularly easy. I think I'm a, a doubting Thomas, probably a bit too quick to ask, where are you, God? And my wife, Sammy, on the other hand, she's the opposite. She didn't have the benefit of growing up in a Christian home like me. And yet her faith, it just never seems to waver. It's rock solid. Wow, I'm really surprised to hear that you struggle with doubt. Oh, no, definitely. At one time, I remember I was sitting by Sammy's hospital bedside, um, just absolutely desperate, as low as you can be, Uh, Sammy had had a particularly serious uh, set of seizures the night before. And with appalling bedside manner, you know, I turned to Sammy and said, do you ever just wonder if maybe God doesn't exist? Mm. And she responded to me, Pete, getting rid of God right now won't solve any of our problems. Isn't that a great reply? Wow, your wife is awesome. (laughs) She said, without God, I wouldn't have hope for this life or the next. 
you know, I do nothing more than a highly evolved animal needing to be flushed out of the gene pool because my body's now broken, right? So I, I think I will stick with trying to trust because it's way better than the alternative. Mm, what a woman. I think I'm going to try and trust because it's way better than the alternative. This morning is, is Palm Sunday, uh, and there is something bittersweet about it, isn't there? That the crowds gather to worship and welcome their new king into Jerusalem. Jesus is honoured and glorified as palms and clothes are laid down in front of his procession. But we also know what is to come. We know soon that Jesus, well, all will turn and will abandon him. The crowds will cry out, crucify, crucify. The reluctant pilot will be manipulated by the people to send Jesus to his death. And so I just wonder whether, particularly this theme for us today of Palm Sunday and Holy Saturday, that they, they come together and they might speak to us today. Maybe you feel like church and coming to church is bittersweet. You've sung the songs You've given your all in worship before. You might have felt like you've given to the cause. But we always, you always now feel, yes, but. You know the dark side of leadership and the pain when things turn so quickly. And I think that this picture is maybe a word for some of us today. Maybe those of us who've been a Christian for a long time, we feel like we've been there, we've done that. And maybe you're even feeling that about this sermon. I've heard it all before. God, you've let me down. God, life is not what I thought it was going to be like. It was not what was promised. The world is still a mess. And maybe you feel like you sacrificed it all for God, but it feels like for nothing. And if you're honest, nothing has changed. Well, today, maybe, maybe God's is starting that journey, or maybe this is a part of that journey, to draw you back once again. I wonder if anybody can tell me what uh, this is. Anybody tell me what this is? A sextant. Can anybody tell me what it does? <laughs> what does a sextant do? What's it used for? Anybody know? Navigation, exactly. Has anyone used one before? Anybody? Yes. Budding sailor here. I don't think there are many budding sailors. I'm guessing you're not. I tend to use Google Maps. It's a lot easier. <laughs> fits, fits in the pocket a lot better. And um, you can use it while you're driving as well, which I think would be a challenge with one of these. Now, of course, the primary use of a sextant is to me measure, and I looked this up this morning, um, uh, to measure the angle between an astronomical object, so something high in the sky, um, and the horizon. So you measure that distance, and you can figure out the, the, the distance of something in front of you, the horizon. Is that about right? Yeah, why not? I'm sure you believe me. So here's where I'm going. Stars, stars can be, and you can use stars to, for this navigation, stars can be tens of thousands of light years away. And if a star dies, it could take tens of thousands of years for us to even notice that the star has died. So it's very possible that a sailor could be using a sextant to be navigating by heavenly lights that might have already died. Just take that in for a moment. Being guided by the light of something 10,000 years old, or the light that shone 10,000 years ago, and by a light that might already be dead. If you fear that God is dead, remember that it's still possible to navigate through the light of dead stars. If you fear that God is dead, remember that it's still possible to navigate through the light of dead stars. So you can still trust the light that you once knew. You can still hold on to the light that was once so clear and it will still carry you through the darkest night to the dawn. 
Corrie ten Boom, who herself went through a Nazi concentration camp. You might have heard of her and the incredible way that she demonstrated her faith, even in light of that. She said this, when a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the engineer. If you feel like you're stuck in Holy Saturday, if you feel like faith, like hope is running out, like it's slipping through your fingers, let me just suggest a few things for you this morning. Number one, have faith in the faith of others. Have faith in the faith of others. Look to those likely more mature, likely who've been through the dark and painful times and have come through the other side. And now that their faith is even stronger, find them, look for them, spend time with them. If you're struggling with faith, have faith in the faith of others. Secondly, make a daily choice to believe your beliefs and doubt your doubts. Believe your beliefs and doubt your doubts. Maybe, like me, you can quickly go to your doubts when life is tough. You quickly find yourself in, oh, I just, what if, what if this is all true or not true? But instead, try to listen, to hold on and believe your beliefs. Because more often than not, belief is a choice. It's a choice that we have to make, even in spite of all that we might see around us and all that we might be going through. And then thirdly, doing the things that you once did, the basics of faith. It is okay to sometimes go through the motions of our faith to feel like we're doing it just because, just because we used to do it and because there's something in that regular rhythm, the spiritual muscle memories, those habits, those rhythms of our faith. We've touched on this many times before. It's important that we stick to those even though we might not feel like doing so. And maybe, just maybe, It's not a crisis of faith that you're going through, but actually it's a growing and going deeper in your faith. Maybe God is at work, even if you can't perceive it. He is there, he is working, he's not abandoned you. And in fact, he wants to say, it's not going to be easy for you to abandon me. The roots of your faith go deeper than you know. We're going to come now to our second reading. And this is some excerpts taken from Psalm 22. As we've touched on, often the Bible is more honest about pain and hurt than the church is. And we can quickly go to the book of Psalms and see the honesty as the writers of those Psalms grapple between this sense of Holy Saturday, between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. It feels like they're in an it's often used phrase, the now and the not yet. They're holding somewhere between hope and the pain. They're in the midst of that. What's interesting about Psalm 22 is that it's likely that Jesus recited this whole psalm as he was on the cross. Jesus uses scripture in the midst of his agony. And so the, li- the Bible gives a language to his heart and his hope, gives language to his anguish and the hope of what is to come. His desperate cry of why turns to a triumphant try- cry of hope. And so what I'd love you to do is to read this with me, and we're going to do it a bit of a kind of a call and response. So you're going to say the bits in 
Let me think about this. Which way we're going to do it. You are going to say the bits in yellow. I'm going to be the doubter. Okay, I'm going to be in that place of pain. And I want you to speak over me the words of hope within this psalm. So I'm going to say the bits on the left. So we usually do it the other way around. So the bits on the left in white. Those sense of doubt and pain. That, as we will see, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then I want you to echo back to me those words of hope on the right-hand side. Uh, and it might be helpful, as you're saying those words, to imagine that you are echoing back to your heart that it might be in that place of pain and doubt and questioning. Let these words speak into that doubt and into the midst of it. So let's do this together. We're going to do it nice and slowly. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. But dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. together we say, prosperity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. This morning we are going to spend some time, as we have been doing during Lent, to respond to what I think God is saying to us this morning. I think this call for some of us to hold on to hope in the midst of our pain. We might feel, as I've touched on, that you are in the midst of that holy Saturday, that actually Easter Sunday just feels too distant, too far away. And maybe you have lost the light at the end of the tunnel. But today, I would encourage you to start to listen to the voice of the Spirit again, once again, calling you, stay, telling you to just hold out, to hold out for hope. God is still at work. He is still moving, and he still longs to meet you and to walk with you in the darkest nights of our soul.